Um, I've had the pleasure and uh, honor of running the successful first time campaign for Andy Lee, Mr. Andy Lee right here, who we'll be hearing from soon. <laughs> He's actually now the Contra Costa Community College District Governing Board Vice President. So one of the things I had to do is figure out how to say that <laughs> it, it in one breath, right? So, uh, so we're gonna be learning a lot today. Um, but before we get started, um, if we can applause for the newly effect, ele elected officials who are joining us here today, uh, just for appreciation. Thank you. So there's no doubt, you know, clearly the, uh, the API community has had a tremendous impact on uh, the election, the last election cycle. Um, between 2000 and 2015, API American population in the U.S. grew 72%. Um, from 11 million to 20 million. Um, in 2018, we accounted for approximately 4% of the, of the vote. And actually, it's even higher in terms of the uh, political uh, contributions. Um, and according to the Pew Research Center, APs are the fastest growing uh, ethnic group in this country. And uh, it's really made a major change in terms of the US political system paying attention to the API community for the first time uh, that we're seeing right now. Um, but why is this happening, right? It's not just the growth of the uh, API community. Um, if you can just raise your hand really quick, just to, to tell me right now, just to show up, raise of hands, who actually voted in this last election cycle? <laughs> if you can, t if you just keep your hands up really quick, look around and look at everyone who actually voted in this election cycle. This is a tremendous number. I, I wasn't actually expecting everybody, <laughs> but this is a huge number. And actually, this is why the American uh, political system is actually now paying attention to the API community. It's not just the growth. It's the fact that we're mobilizing together. We're coming together. Um, we're getting educated. Um, we're, we're learning the political system. And we're actually getting out to the, to the polls. So this is a, a, a tremendous, tremendous change in this in, in this uh, in this country, um, and you know, uh, so going forward, right? It's not just getting out to vote. It's it's also looking at your friends and getting them to vote, getting your friends and family, um, and maybe even taking that a step further and potentially looking at voting. Um, well, not just that, but looking at potentially running yourself, right? Uh, who? Uh, and connecting with organizations like Civic Leadership Forum USA, as well as APAPA, this is who we have to thank for in terms of the, you know, going forward and, and this mobilization that I was talking about. Um, so really, uh, it's again, not the growth, not just the growth, but it's us coming together on a Sunday afternoon to be educated and be empowered by these organizations like APAPA, and Civic Leadership USA um, uh, going forward, okay? Um, so without further ado, what I was gonna do is uh, go ahead and introduce um, Anthony Ng, who is actually the, the director, executive director for uh, Civic Leadership Forum. So I have a little introduction here for him. Anthony currently serves as the executive director of the Civic Leadership USA he also has served as executive director and board secretary of Vision New America Foundation and vice president of the Life Transformation Foundation International. Anthony brings over 30 years of experience in working with an array of institutions ranging from state government, arts and culture, education and social services to community development and private foundations, including the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts, Prince Music Theater, African American Museum, Pew Charitable Trusts, and Barnes Foundation. He is the former VP and COO of Nueva Esperanza USA, president and CEO of the Latin American Economic Development Association, and executive director of the Chinese Newcomers Service Center. Please join me in welcoming Anthony Ng. Thank you, Scott. I, I hope I can live up to all this. Uh, that was my last life, and but it is not about me. Today it is about a journey that you are on with us, 
Uh, first of all, I have to thank you, Andy and Nancy. I see uh, quite a few of them. I remember in, in 2015, December 5th, one person stream from my chairman, Sandy Chow, we want to get people together and see how we could work together. It was December 5th, 2015 in San Mateo. That is our first civic leadership forum. I have that big picture took by Wesley. And some of them now are here, such as from the audience. Now they are the public servant like Andy. And quite a few of them. Sure, uh, it's all right. Um, but today it is a chance for us to hear some of the first time running API public servant. Remember, I don't call them politician because they are making sacrifice to serve the public. That's why I like to use that term. And, and I want to thank them to share a piece of their heart and their journey. What I do is like the format because I don't know them well. So instead of reading out from your bio, I would like from you to tell the audience who you are, three questions. Beside your bio, your background, your wonderful experience, one is why you want to run. Second, it is what are the major challenges during your campaign so that all of us can, can learn from it. The third thing is, what are the, I would call the Kodak moment that you can remember during the campaign that make you so joyful? Or what are the most satisfying thing that you, you can encounter during that journey? And the last the take home I added to it is, what are the take home or your future aspiration that you can share with us, what you would like to do onward, that we can also be part of your partner and help and support. So the question layout is, uh, is fair to everyone. So can you change the another slide so I can put their picture on? All right, so from the one side going this way, so I will have Sean be the first one. And Sean, I know these all three are city council of different city. If you look at Dublin City Council, Haywood, and St. Ramon. And each of them are also the first time running. Is it? Okay, that's fine. But, uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> but the most important it is you persist and you come out. And that also a great experience to serve with us. So without further delay, I will have Sean Kumagai and come out and take the mic. And I would like you to tell us about yourself and then answer that free question. And I would like everyone hold off the question that you have for all three of them. Let them all finish, they were all on the stage. Then we will have a time for Q&A for you all to ask some of, some of maybe your burning mm, mm, uh, question or some of the interesting component when they mention about their background that you want to further explore. Is it like a friend? Good, okay, Sean. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, thank you, uh, A. Papa and uh, Andy Lee for putting this together. This is really an honor to be here with you on this Sunday. Uh, my name is Sean Kumagai. I ran and uh, was successful in my bid for Dublin City Council. Uh, I am a 17-year Navy veteran. I did 10 years active duty and seven years in the reserves. That's when I first uh, came to know about Dublin. I was assigned there as a reservist to a facility called Camp Parks and worked uh, for an intelligence unit there. Uh, so when I was coming back from a deployment three years ago, I was looking for a place to settle down 
I'm kind of on the tail end of my military career and want to finally settle into community. And I chose Dublin because uh, it's a great place to raise a family. It's very safe. It's community oriented. It has great schools. And at the time, I was taking um, custody of my younger brother after our mother uh, had passed away. So he was coming to live with us. And I just knew that Dublin would be a great place for him to uh, finish out his schooling and, and go on and do good things. So uh, getting there, you know, I'm, I'm, my whole family, uh, come, I come from a veteran's family. My grandfather served in World War II. My mother was in the Army Nurse Corps. My, uh, her brother, my uncle, uh, is an Air Force Academy grad, and I opted to go into the Navy and, and serve there. Uh, so service is part of our DNA. So when I was getting settled in and, and, you know, bought a place in Dublin and started to think about ways that I could get involved, um, I got very involved with political organizing, issues-oriented organizing. And through that, I came in contact a lot with not only the city council in Dublin, but city councils uh, and, you know, uh, county boards of supervisors throughout the region. And you start to realize as you start to advocate for certain issues at that level that there is a tremendous opportunity to have a positive impact on people's lives at the city council level. And unlike uh, national level, where it's these days just seems like gridlock, on city council, you can go and you just need to convince three people. You know, on, on Dublin City Council, we have five, so majority is three people. You just need to convince three people about a particular policy or issue, and you can make a difference in people's lives. So through that experience, I came to realize that city council was a way that I could give back to my community and I could serve my community and apply some of the, uh, the experience I had, uh, my leadership experience um, in service of the people of Dublin. Um, the, uh, what was it, the, the, best, the best moments of the campaign? Uh, the, the closest one, uh, uh -huh. Okay, so uh, the challenges. So running for a first time is challenging. You know, uh, we're very fortunate in Dublin. We have a very diverse population. We doubled in size over the past 20 years. And with that growth, we have a, had an influx of API uh, residents, uh, citizens in Dublin. So we have a large API population. We have a large uh, Chinese American population, Indo uh, and S South Asian population in Dublin. And uh, the prior council to this one had two Indo-Americans serving on it. Uh, of our candidates who ran this time was myself. I'm of uh, Japanese descent. My, my father's a uh, first generation immigrant from Japan. Um, I'm half Japanese. And then uh, we also had two Indo-Americans running in various races in that race. So it didn't, it didn't really feel like it mattered in Dublin. It wasn't a hurdle. But what I would say is just in general, being a first time candidate, uh, it's tremendously difficult to raise money, uh, especially for a race like city council when you talk to pe most people and they don't even know who their council members are or what the city council does. So it's a very low information race and getting people interested in that and getting them to wanna donate money to that is even harder. But I'll say the hardest thing, even harder than raising money, is uh, getting people to volunteer. Getting people to take the time out of their day to put themselves out there to join you on that journey and give their time and get out there and, and advocate for you. The easiest thing is getting people's votes. If you talk to people and you, and you listen and you talk about the issues, you'll get their vote. But the thing is, is that you have to get to as many people as possible to earn those votes, and that's the hard thing, and that's what takes the time, the money, and the volunteers. But I will say the greatest pleasure of the experience was knocking on doors and talking to people, listening to what their issues are, learning from their experience, and, and uh, talking about how we can you know, so solve some of the, the challenges that they're facing in the city. I, I would do that all day. If I could, if I could not fundraise, and if I could not do all the endorsement meetings and all that kind of stuff and then just knock on doors and talk to constituents, that uh, was the most enjoyable thing. As far as future aspirations, um, 
I applied for a four-year job on the Dublin City Council, and I will put all of my time and effort into serving the citizens of Dublin for four years. And um, after that, I will decide if I'm going to run for re-election in Dublin. We have uh, two term limits, so you can run for a total of uh, serve for a total of eight years on the council. So I'll make that decision when I cross that bridge. And um, but I will say that I will continue to uh, f look for ways that I can serve uh, my community uh, and the people around me. And that's what I, that's that's part of my blood, and that's what I'll continue to do. Very good timing, just five minutes. So please take a seat, and then we will, we will have those turn. Uh, next one, Aisha. I appreciate it. Um, well, I just want to start off by thanking Apapa. Thank you for our host. Uh, thank you for having us. Um, I echo very much what Sean stated, um, that this was my first run for public office. It was a whirlwind of experiences, emotions, um, and quite a, quite a bit of things. Uh, my background is I'm ethnically an Afghan American. Now, we are Asian. We are not usually identified as Asian, uh, but as I mentioned many times before, um, we were part of the original Silk Road. We touched China, and we have had more invaders than any other country in the world, too. So uh, we have a very long history, a uh, very misunderstood history, but I am very proud to say that I am an Afghan American and an Asian American. Um, you know, my background's a little bit different than, than many people uh, that I come across. Uh, I grew up in foster care. So very similar to a lot of other ethnic communities, uh, my family immigrated to the United States primarily for a better opportunity for their children. They escaped a war with the Soviet Union invading into Afghanistan. And as you guys know, Afghanistan has still dealing with another war. And um, there is not a single generation of Afghans alive today that has not been impacted by war. So if you really think about that, we have experienced no peace except for in this country. Now, I, because of the way I grew up and because of my exposure to different communities, different families, different languages throughout the United States, um, I've always felt very much attached to the community because I relied more than anybody else on the community. And when I got into a position, you know, my family very much um, emphasized education. Education was the number one thing as a child. Um, I obtained my master's in business. And my sister obtained her master's in social work. And we've always given back to the community. Um, I served on uh, different nonprofit boards. I served as the chair of the Alameda County Human Relations Commission, as a public health commissioner. I volunteered for Obama's campaign, Clinton's campaign, and many others. Um, the more I got involved with, as Sean stated, issues from education, women's rights, domestic violence, uh, immigration, things like that, you realized how much policy affects what you can do as a nonprofit, as a community, for the um, understanding of the issue, for the funding of an issue. Policy directs everything. And coming from that point of view, we realized that I needed to work more with elected officials. And then I realized that elected officials, not all of them understand your community, especially a community that's small in population, that is very much misunderstood that is seen as unidentifiable based on our numbers. Um, and the more I, I notice this and the lack of regard for my community, the more upset I would get. So for example, Hayward has 25% Asian population. Now this 25% is segmented in so many different categories of what an Asian is, right? And uh, there was the larger community, for example, we have the Asian Business Alliance. It's separate from the chamber. Why? And I asked, why, why are we separating ourselves from the chamber of the city? 
And they said, because they don't understand how we do business, how we network, what we want to do. And I, I heard this more and more. And one of the reasons why I decided to run is that even though Hayward is considered by many standards affordable to live in, by various standards, um, in Hayward, it is not affordable to live in. Um, our population has increased. Our homeless population has increased. We have students at Cal State East Bay, Chabot College, and the Chiropractic College that are sleeping in their cars. We have a huge amount of development, however, no real capacity in regards to affordable housing. I ran on two issues, affordable housing at all income levels and economic development, two things that sustain people, families, and communities. And um, one of the greatest joys I had, very similar to Sean, was actually knocking on the doors. Because when you have that face-to-face -face with a person, you can explain all your you know, stances on different issues. People care about different issues. Some care about lighting, some care about potholes, some care about um, their future and their children's education. Um, some of the difficulties in, in our campaign, which I was uh, disturbed a little bit by, because I am racially ambiguous, I didn't think that my race would matter. However, it did matter. It mattered greatly. Um, my name is different than most people's name. It's you know not a Jane Smith. It is Aisha Wahab. The last name it, uh, itself is a very polarizing name in the sense that it is a very Muslim name. Um, you know, I was criticized for being Latino because people assumed I was Mexican. I was criticized for being Indian because people assumed I was Indian. I was criticized for a number of different reasons. And uh, you know, the more I realized that people want to know what you are, the more I realized that I had to say I'm an Afghan American, which allowed me to actually talk about my ethnicity, my culture, my history, and how much respect and love I have for it. So it made me actually be more proud and more confident in saying it. Um, one of the things that I do want to say is that we had our car broken into and our campaign literature stolen. We had comments on Facebook, social media, and directly to my face at very important high-profile events. Um, I was one of the top fundraising candidates in my race. In four months, we raised over $40,000. And as Sean stated, money is one of the most important things that we can actually do for a candidate, especially a local candidate and a first time candidate. And I was asked by some people in the city, do I take money from ISIS? And I was quite shocked to even, I, I, I actually originally thought they said a name like Ashley and I, I said, excuse me? And the individual repeated themselves and said Saudi Arabia. And I said, no, that would be illegal, and you know, I have no ties, and you know, just shocked that somebody would say something like that to my face. I was told that you should bleach your eyebrows to blend in more, because I'm fair-skinned. The fact that that happens in the Bay Area was quite disgusting. You know, my parents have an accent, you know, so I, I heard some of the commentary about, you know, English, or grammar, things like that things that chip away as a human being in your heart. But we continued to move forward. And we learned that there were actually people that stood up for us without us asking for their help. People that said that that's not fair. This is not the America that we know and come to for a better opportunity to be treated equally. So I'll be honest with you, I, I learned so much. It was an emotional roller coaster. And my greatest joy, to be honest, was actually winning. Um, you know, that I think, you know, just allows you to be happy. That night, um, I don't know about you, Sean, but I, I had a lot of anxiety. I did not want to talk to anybody. I did not, I wanted to be in a dark room and just see the results. And when the results came out positive, I was very, very happy. Um, we had a lot of young people volunteer. We had a lot of women volunteer. We had a lot of first time individuals that have no political background and no political aspiration support the campaign. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what we look like, it doesn't matter how we speak, what matters is the issues that affect all of us. 
So I'm very happy to share anything and answer any questions. Thank, thank you. I have to learn how to say it correctly. Aisha. Aisha. Okay, now Sabina Safar from San Ramon City Council. And also you noticed that there are four chairs here. So there is a meaning, means that I saw someone, it's a Benny, Benny, hi, Sing Leandro. So the seat is for you. So you, you, you cannot get rid, so now free first time and then one veteran. Hi everybody, my name is Sabina Zafar. Um, I am uh, elected to the San Ramon City Council. Um, I did, like I mentioned, this was my second run. I ran in 2016, um, learned a lot, but also realized that you may not get in the first time, but you have to persist and you have to continue to show up. And so for me, that was very important. And obviously victory was sweet in 2018, but um, to talk about a little bit about my journey and my background. Um, so heritage wise, I am Pakistani American. I lived in the United States now more than 22 years. I moved here, um, went to college here and raised my family here. So I have two kids, one is 21, graduated from college here and the other is in high school. Uh, my journey to San Ramon started about 12 years ago when I moved to San Ramon. Um, Doherty Valley, if you guys are familiar with, some of you are familiar with it, was just starting out. And the population with San Ramon was half of what, what it is today. The demographics of San Ramon were very, very different. So I moved to this new community, not knowing a whole lot, but because my best friend lived there, I decided to call San Ramon home. Um, my kids went to schools in San Ramon. I was working full time, sometimes commuting to San Francisco or Foster City or wherever I was working. And before I knew it, we were 10 years forward. Uh, my kids were in high school and much older. And I thought, I started thinking about it. I'm like, I have lived in a great community that has allowed me to raise my children as a single parent, not ever worry about their safety in a community where there are good schools. And then as I looked around me, the community had changed. And the Asian population, as Doherty Valley was built out with 11,000 homes, the Asian population pretty much all moved to Doherty Valley. So our high schools are now 98% Asian. Um, and as of the last census, the Asian population in San Ramon is 38%. And as I started getting more and more involved in the city, as I had that time and opportunity, what I noticed was that there was no representation of the community. There was nobody speaking the language. There were just a few of us. Andy was one of them. Nancy was there. There were a few of us that were showing up everywhere and trying to you know, represent our communities. But we noticed one, our community just wasn't interested or did not have the time or did not know how to get involved. And for me, it was um, thinking about it and really saying, what am I doing then? If I see this gap, what am I doing? to come and show up and bring the community behind me. Um, I do a little bit of history, come back from, you know, in Pakistan, I do belong, I did belong to family that was very, very involved for generations in public service. Um, and as a new generation immigrant, when I moved to the US, I kind of, you know, did the thing which all of us do, make sure we have good jobs, make sure we have a good life for the kids. And you kind of forget about that public service aspect. So years later, it came back to me and I'm like, okay, I've lived here this long. It is my time to make sure that I give back to the community I've taken away from so much. So I started getting involved um, in San Ramon. I started getting involved in some committees and some leadership um, classes and things like that again, where Andy and I did leadership San Ramon Valley together and learning about you know, how cities are run and communities work and function. Um, and I thought at some point I would like to, you know, have a seat at the table. And the table I saw, not that I have anything against it, but a community, is this working? Yeah. Uh, a community which had become highly diverse, did, ha did not have 
any voice at the table. And I love to quote this, that if you do not have a seat at the table, then you're on the menu. And somebody else is making those decisions for you. Um, so, you know, I decided it's a tough one. Somebody's got to stand up and do this. Um, so I'm going to run for office. Now, I absolutely, you know, there were hurdles. Um, there were hurdles because I was told it's not my time to run. And I'll be told when I should run. And you don't tell that to somebody like me. <laughs> I'm like, I decide. I went and talked to my family, talked to my kids, and I said, I'm going to take this on. This is going to take a lot of my time and energy and time away from you and time in, in the public eye. Are you guys okay with this? And they're like, Mom, nobody can ever tell you what to do. You do what you think is right. So getting a nod from my, my kids was the big thing for me where I said, okay, now I'm going to do this. Um, campaigning is obviously not easy. Uh, you know, some of it you learn. Some of it you um, kind of, uh, you know, on, it's kind of on the job. You learn what works, what doesn't work. Um, some of the hurdles in campaigning were trying to understand, you know, obviously not being the favorite candidate. How do you, how do you work with the people? And the more you, you are on there door knocking and canvassing, like both Aisha and Sean mentioned, knocking on doors and talking on people is what really energizes you and really tells you you are doing the right thing because you're doing it for the people. You're not doing it for egos. You're not doing it to become somebody important, but because you want to serve your community. So um, some of the things, um, I guess, that I learned on the campaign trail was fundraising is a key part of campaigning. You have to be able to raise money in order, to, in order to win the campaign, just because it's marketing 101. Um, and one of my base for fundraising was that I had been so involved with so many organizations, helping them raise money, and we're great. Our communities are great about raising money for good causes, for schools, for charities. But when it comes to campaigns, I still find it a challenge to raise money from the APIs, because it just doesn't make sense to them right now, right? We're, but, what, but once you're able to show them the vision, and I have to say what happened in 2016, really um, things that happened and as communities were, you know, um, were targeted, people woke up. There was, there was a huge difference between the 2016 campaign and the 2018 campaign in the sense that people really woke up and realized that it is very important for us to have that voice at the table, because otherwise we will be stuck with decisions we may or may not like. Um, so what was the moment, the, the best moment in my campaign probably, like Sean said, was um, knocking on doors, talking to people, walking precincts, because it energized me so much. I, I didn't even sometimes talk, and I let the other people talk, and I'm like, they're talking my campaign message. So it reiterated that what I was going out there to put out my campaign message, what I was talking about, bringing our communities together, making sure that people who are first generation immigrants feel like this is home for them. This is where they belong. And this is where their voice should be. They should be represented. So I was very fortunate um, in you know, meeting all the people that I did. I also work in technology. And for me, it has been very, very important and one of the key issues to make sure we get more technology jobs out in, in the Tri-Valley. We Because people's work-life balance right now is so affected by their commutes, by, their, by them traveling out, out of the East Bay, and I'm you know, very focused on the East Bay and the Tri-Valley. Their, their work-life balance is so much affected right now by being on the road for th two, three, four hours that for me, the biggest thing would be able to bring those jobs, that investment, to the Tri-Valley because there is so much brain power over there right now. Um, so um, thank you so much. I, again, really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to speak. I have met with, I met with Andy three years ago, four years ago, and, you know, have since been involved with APAPA, and it's been an amazing journey with APAPA's support as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. Please have a seat.
now you get a, a sense of even though they are first timer, they are not first timer. You listen to their background, listen to their passion, listen to their journey. They went for a lot and make that decision. So I I'm happy you you you're not stealing my life because I steal this from Andy. Andy, take it from it is. If you're not at the table, you will be on the menu, and I'm happy to push another notch. Now some of us are at the table, but we still ordering from the menu that written by somebody else. What does it mean? It means we're still following whatever the policy written by someone that doesn't have us in mind. So until we all can write that policy together, then we can change the time. So let's work towards that. And so after you hear the first timer, uh, I, I said there is a one empty seat is with a reason because I spot Benny is there. Many people know Benny from Saint Leandro City Council, but what I would like to invite him because most of us know you. We we don't need to listen to your beautiful background. But what I would like you to be here, help us, and also answer the the question with the audience to talk about how it's different when you first run, and when you see now, has it been changed, and from the supporter from the general audience because when I look around and go around the country, I'm still getting Asian voting percentage is under 40 percent. We have a long way to go because why I say that? Just Chinese American, five million. Filipino American, four million. But all the APIA together is over 22 million. Imagine if we can have 22 million, 40% increase to 70%. We will be the swing world. So that is why we're doing this around the country. So Benny, uh, may I steal you a few moments? I know you're not prepared. He, he, he wasn't prepared, but I, I, I want him to come out so, so that we have, have this. It is because if you look at our slogan, diverse in leadership, inclusive in participation, and look at that panel, it's a beautiful picture. And thank you for what you share a piece of your life. So Benny, uh, one minute, and then we'll go into Q&A, and everybody get your burning question to be answered. Okay, here we go. So, you know, I, I share actually uh, their same thoughts. When I first ran, I actually had some of those challenges. Fundraising was very difficult because my campaign at that time cost me $38,000. I raised $6,000 and I was $32,000 in debt. So uh, if that uh, says how tough it was, it was really tough. Uh, fortunately, in 2016, when I ran for re-election, uh, my fundraising wasn't as challenging, uh, probably because of everything that I set out to do, I did, uh, particularly on a diversity perspective. In uh, I'll be quite honest, 80% of uh, those who donated to my campaign were of Asian ethnic backgrounds, right? And uh, for my mayor's race, uh, I think I uh, raised nearly $100,000, right? Uh, it scared the bajizis out of the mayor because she only raised $40,000. It was a tough race because she's a very, very popular mayor, and I think I did very well. Uh, I give her a lot of credit in terms of the way she ran her campaign. It was a tough campaign, and you know I still uh, am very happy with what I did. I'm very impressed with every, uh, the work that all of you have done. Actually, Aisha, I'm very impressed with what you've done because uh, you are a first timer. You ran against incumbents, and you were the top vote getter, and that is an uh, anomaly. Uh, so obviously, I'm interested in hearing on what you did to uh, get out there. But everything that you guys have said is exactly uh, the same. Hitting the doors, talking to the people, and getting to know your community is the best way to win a campaign. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Uh, I'll take another one. Well, 
loud enough so I don't need a mic. <laughs> uh, so now is the time. Testing, testing. It's off. Okay. Um, sorry about a little bit. Now is the time for us. I know some of you sitting there that you might already thinking, I would like to run. And I'm planning to run, but didn't know where to start or what are the do's and don'ts. I know some of them in the audience are thinking, and also some of them are, I know someone should be running, but they might need a little nudge. So now, any of those questions, please. Now I have all this wonderful city council member there answer all the questions. Okay, I see one, two, three, so let's do that. Yeah, so my name is Nolan, and just wanna say I was very impressed with the personal stories of all three council members. Thank you very much. This one's probably more aimed at Sabina because you talked a little bit about your background in corporate America and your life as a mother. I think what holds back a lot of people sometimes, right, is we're all busy going to work and taking care of our families. Could you offer any advice how to balance public service with family life and corporate life? Yeah, um, I think one of the reasons I say I'm a poster child of when you get to work local, you give back to your community. And being in the city, you know, as long as I was on the road, I was commuting for two, three hours. I'm like, I just came home, shut, you know, uh, gave the kids some dinner went to bed, woke up the next morning, which a lot of our citizens are doing, right? So one of the key things was being in the community, being able to work local so that I had more time, and time is important, you need the time. And then you start by joining something small, join a committee, which requires you to commit to an hour or two hours of your time during the month, right? And that's kind of your first step to kind of understand what's going on. Also, besides the com you know, committees, what I also notice is joining local organizations like the Rotary Club or AUW and foundations like that to see what your community is like, what people want. And, and that kind of sets you up to do the next step and the next step. And, and then it's really you know, up to you how passionate. It takes immense amount of passion, I have to tell you, because it is hard work. It's not easy to balance that, but if you love it, if you're passionate about it, if if you, you know, your cause is there, then then it'll it'll happen. You'll slowly make your way in, and then you'll be like, oh, this is not that hard, and this is not that hard. I can do this. So, I think it it. But start with some the first thing. You have to start with that first step of getting engaged and and coming forward. Is what I would say. Thank you. Next one. Oh, thank you, Anthony. Hi. Uh, uh, I'm Marsha Kalanko with uh, Apapa Tri Valley Chapter. Um, I have a, um, I, I'm a community advocate for many, many years. And uh, usually the kind of uh, leadership positions uh, 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 by nomination uh, or and somebody appointed me. Um, so uh, I, my question is how, when you are running your campaign, how strong a desire is your, you want to win? Uh, because I find myself uh, first time in um, a local election uh, process that I'm still in a supportive role. I look at all the candidates, including myself, and I say, oh, I know them, I'm, they are very good. And um, I'm still in the, uh, in the place that, oh, I want to support others. So I want to hear from you how strong is your desire that you want to be elected. I'll go ahead and start. Uh, you know, after I got, a, you know, it, it's interesting because I started actually uh, about 20 years ago supporting other candidates and um, there was no Asian candidates in uh, San Leandro City Council. When I ran in 2012, uh, I went out to the 
the folks to ask for their support. I got their endorsements, but I didn't get as much in, uh, support. So much of it was I had to build my own support base. Uh, I realized how difficult it, w it is to run for campaigns. So as a result, I've dedicated myself to help uh, many others. In 2016, uh, fortunately, when I didn't have to run uh, for uh, re-election um, because I was unopposed, I guess I ran against myself, uh, I had uh, I supported over 20 different campaigns. And even in this last um, election, uh, while I was running for mayor, I f supported 14 different uh, campaigns. In order to um, in order to move that next to that next notch, we can't just sit idle and just focus on ourselves. We have to focus on uh, uh, mentoring that next that, uh, next next generation uh, who's going to get into office, and also tr constantly encourage and give of our time and our resources in order to make that uh, happen. Uh, Amy just raised his hand because we were on the phone um, several times a week just talking about the election on what needed to be done next. There was a number of other candidates uh, that we had talked to. Uh, I remember, uh, I, I can't say I can take any credit for Aisha, but I re remember reaching out to Aisha at one point and talking about her campaign. I think probably all of us up here have been in a supportive role before we came here. And I think that that comes from a place of service. And if you want to enter government service, then you should be passionate about serving. And that means putting someone else or a community or an interest above yourself. So I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But I think that uh, you will know when the opportunity comes along that you are passionate about. And then you have to truly feel like I am the best one to offer to this. And I will say this about, this is kind of a generalization, but in general, the API community, we uh, value humility and being humble and not being outspoken, right, in many ways. Uh, I think we have to get past that because if we don't, if we don't get past that cultural difference and we, and we just say, you know what, um, I am the best one for this job and I can do it and um, I am willing to serve and I will get out there and do that. Um, you know, I genuinely think it's based on personality. We all have different personalities. I'm sure as parents, you guys all see the difference in personality amongst your children, even though they go to maybe the, the same school and they have the same parents and they deal with the same things. Um, so, you know, I, I always like to joke, I, I will say that I was born in the year of the tiger and hour of the dragon. Um, so for me, uh, winning is obviously a goal. Um, it is something that, uh, you know, even when I was in high school playing tennis, you know, obviously you want to win, right? Um, and you want to win because you want to make a difference. You want your voice heard. If you do not win, as Sabina has stated, and if you're not at the table, you can't do much, right? You can only advocate. Um, I think that at the end of the day also, for example, we're in city council races, so we end up, you know, dis knowing whether or not we're going to win and go to that next level in November. However, many people that run for assembly, they have that pre-win um, dis deciding factor in June during our primary, right? And so I also think that when you do lose, let's say if you lost in June, it's also supporting you know, who will advocate for those issues? My number one thing, as I s stated early on, is the issue. And I will say that we have such a resource here in, in the Bay Area and within the API community. So for example, Benny is a very successful council member in San Leandro. He is somebody that we all know, that we all have heard of. So when I would engage with Benny, of course I wanna ask him a million questions. How'd you do it? What do I do? What's the next step? Things like that. And I give Benny a hard time because of the fact that I know he endorsed one of my opponents, right? And that's what happens in politics. <laughs> okay? So Benny's still a good guy. You know, he, he would, we would talk on the phone and he goes, you know, he, he talked to me about messaging. He talked to me about, you know, some of the things that he would suggest to me. And it's up to us whether or not we're going to take that suggestion, right? 
um, you have that and you know, you, you're in a position like Benny where he is an elected and he has previous relationships and he has um, these, these duties plus he's running for office himself. So we then you know, have conversations with Sean and Sean's in a different city. Uh, Sabina, you know, I was very fortunate and I asked her, you know, hey, you, know, you ran the first time, how was it? How much money? There's, for example, groups that will say, we'll give you this much money and you know, just side with us. And I asked Sabina, in your experience, what have they done for you? And she said, nothing. And then that's when you realize, okay, I gotta cut my losses and move forward. So there is a pool of resources, even if you're a first time candidate, a second candidate, um, or even you know experienced council member or anything like that. You have to seek the knowledge. That is one of the things. Again, it's all about personality. How much do you want it? How much do you wanna educate yourself? And how much will you work for it? So that's my two cents on that. I'll just share a story which I think every time I'm running for something because I'm like, I have to go get it. So I, this was maybe in seventh or eighth grade. I was in a race and I was coming in second behind somebody and that person was so far ahead of me that I'm like, yeah, I'm never going to come first. Forget it. So I kind of slowed down. And the funny thing happened, this person collapsed just before reaching the finish line and the person who was way behind me passed me and won. And that was my a moment of, oh my God, I let this person get away and I let that, that race get away from me. So every time I'm running for something, I think back to that time in my childhood and I'm like, you have to continue running. You cannot look around you and see and listen to the external voices that will tell you, oh, this candidate is winning for sure. They have the support of this person or this candidate is running for sure because they are incumbent or they have raised that much money. You have to focus on your win. You really have to be, I am the best candidate. If I've put my heart and soul in this, I'm going to give it my all. And that's when you win or lose, it doesn't feel like losing because you gave everything to that. So winning is, you just have to give your heart and soul. You have to give it your best and then whatever comes, you'll be able to embrace it so much easier. So that's why I say 2016 for me was a win because I was able to get more votes than I'd ever get gotten in my life, which was zero. So, you know, <laughs> and so that means that many more people believed in my message and I just had to continue that and continue running. So that's, I think, how you win. You might think these people are great, articulate, you know them, but maybe people connect with you and they're like, no, Marsha represents us. She looks like me. I want to vote for her. So we never know. We'll know. <laughs> okay. Uh, Time-wise, we left for one last question, which I honor already raised their hand and already got the mic. So this will be our last question to the panel. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and time with us. My question is this. Knowing what you know now, what would you have put more focus, effort, and time in? And what would you have never done at all? I'll go ahead and start. <clears throat> well, you know, in, in my campaign, uh, the first thing that we did is we really focused on the data. Uh, the data actually helped uh, tell us what the message should be. It told us where our strengths were and where our weaknesses were. Uh, but it's always going to be an educator. You're going to guess on your messaging because when you talk to a lot of folks when you knock on their doors, you're going to get a sleuth of different messages and some of the same messages. Sometimes you can focus on those messages and it will help you gain those votes. But in other cases, sometimes you have to change that message. So um, I focused on the message of uh, in uh, San Leandro on uh, certain jobs, uh, projects not getting done because that had an impact. Uh, did I think that was the right messaging? I certainly did, but it was not the messaging that resonated with the, the population. Uh, we're in the process of uh, purchasing the uh, voter data to actually uh, identify who voted. We're going to be looking at the statement of vote to take a look at every single precincts and break down the, the demographics of the precincts to try to understand what we did right and what we did wrong. But what uh, the beauty of that is that regardless of whatever messaging you have and what, whatever outcome, every single uh, great 
thing about data is that you still can uh, get a very good educated guess of what you did well, what you didn't do well. So I look forward to looking at that information. That's a very difficult question. Um, I think, uh, you know, my general feeling is I would like, if I, uh, next time I run, I would like to have it to be, it to be more data focused um, because there is a tremendous amount of work to do, but you can never do it all, right? You can never knock on every single door. You can never talk to every single voter. So trying to make sure that your efforts are as efficient as possible in reaching as many people. Um, we did not do a, a really good job. We did use data um, and we did do targeted, uh, a targeted field campaign, uh, but um, we didn't do as good of a job tracking our IDs and getting identifications of supporters or people who were um, uh, on the fence. And um, I've heard from other candidates that they did a really good job of, of tracking that and then following up with targeted mail or targeted communications to those folks specifically. Uh, so I, I would do more of that. And I don't know if there's any one thing that I would just not do, but I would say that one thing next time, I will probably spend less time and effort with endorsements, um, especially at that level of a race. Uh, endorsements are good. You need some endorsements. But I think ultimately you have to be, um, again, efficient with who you're going to target and, and why. Um, now, going through it, I know which one of the my endorsers actually gave money and got their supporters to come out and walk for me. So to me, those are the valuable endorsements. Um, the other ones where they don't bring resources to the table, um, I, I won't say that they're a, wa a complete waste of time, but it's not as efficient. Um, personally, I, I agree very much that data is probably one of the most important things you can um, understand. And uh, I was actually, one of the reasons why I spoke to B Benny was because I was actually told that he's a master at data. So I, I still want to talk to him about data. Um, for me, in my situation, because I had two incumbents that were running for re-election, and as I was told, there was no real genuine scandal to be a challenger. Um, in my heart, I knew that uh, the direction of the city, the majority of people wanted it a different direction. And so for me, I didn't think that that was a good enough reason not to run. Um, one of the things that I do want to say is that I, I, I would still like to fundraise a little bit stronger, even though I came out strong. Uh, primarily because I am in a little debt right now, so I, I have to figure that one out, right? And um, part two is the fact that in when you're running for office and you put yourself out there, everyone is in your ear. Every single person is, is talking. And whether they're a friend, whether they're an ally, whether they actually don't even like you, it's a lot of noise in your ear. And uh, for the first couple months, I completely, everyone was like, what is Aisha doing? You know, nobody saw me. I didn't attend any event. Everyone was wondering, what am I doing? Um, I didn't get the police endorsement of my city. I did not get the fire endorsement of my city. And I did not get the chamber endorsement of my city. I got zero council members of my city backing me. I got zero anybody in my city backing me, right? So you wonder, you second guess yourself like, okay, what can I do to change that? The reality is that if I could go back, I would tell myself, relax. Some of these people are out of touch and you do not need them. So that is something to be an independent character. Sometimes you have to realize that it's okay not to have people support you, that you still mean something in your voice. Um, what I would like to uh, potentially not do um, so I definitely don't want to listen to people as much. Uh, the other aspect is the fact that we didn't have a consultant, primarily because it costs so much money, right? So having done this twice and kind of, you know, I, I did in my head what would write the first time, what was, you know, right the next time that I did. Um, one of the things, obviously, data is king. I think we all seem to agree here that the more data, the more information you have about your voters, about your precincts, about about your uh, constituents, 
you were able to do a better job of reaching out to them. Uh, for me, the first time around, I think I was very focused on a certain demographic. And what I realized the second time around is that these are my people. My people will come for me. I don't, I, they know me. They've known me for the last 10, 12 years. I need to focus on people that do not know me at all, that, that don't know who I am, that don't know my background, that might even be fearful of who I am. And so this time around, focusing on precincts that I, I pretty much took numbers from my last precinct. First, I broke it down by where I won the precincts. And I started with those focusing and making sure people who voted for me before came back and voted for me. And then I went into precincts with the highest number of voters. And they were on the west side of San Ramon and really focused my efforts on people who did not know me and getting to know them. So that, I think, was a key differentiator even between my two campaigns. I had been too much in my comfort zone in my first campaign. I really came out of my comfort zone. The other thing, especially at the local level, it's very, very important to remember is these are not party-based elections. People care about how you will affect their day-to-day -day lives, how, what kind of change and difference are you going to make in their day-to-day, -day, and how you will help them in their neighborhood, in their community. So really understanding the issues of each and every community and how one is different from the other and, and having that understanding is, I think, key to what people, people like to hear. And the, uh, the third lesson is people do not like negative campaigning. People actually connect with positive campaigning. They like, you know, it's the same thing that if you live, you know, you, to your relatives, you can say anything, but you don't want anybody else coming and saying anything about them. It's the same, you know, if your city, there might be issues, there might be problems, but if you keep criticizing, people kind of move away from you. People want to hear the good things and how you will make them better. So those were some important things that I learned and I, I think are important to think about. Thank you. So now you hear a common thread. We come to an end, but it's not an end. Uh, all I want to put in one scoop is be the change. You want to see changes in our world. And they're all doing it in their own way, in their, own, in their time, and I hope that we can do it together. So my, my prayer or my hope, one day I don't need to address you as African-American or Chinese-American, I'll just address you, we are fellow Americans. That will be the day that we don't see any of those boundaries, only see the common ground. And, and I thank you for the effort. So I, I encourage those who are not happy with whatever happening in your city, don't get angry. Get even by participate. And they are. They participate by actively running for the position. So another big applause to the panel. Thank you for sharing a piece of your life. And thank you for your service to your city. And uh, let us know how we can work together in the future, and I'm sure they'll all contact you later on. So I, I have to hand the mic back to the second panel. Uh, it, an even better one, because it's closer to home, it's your own school district, and, and that is related to your kids, to your family. So please uh, have another wonderful, wonderful model. Please come out. Uh,